thank you for joining us. This is the uh, Senate COVID-19 Task Force. And on our agenda today, we will be hearing from uh, University of Hawaii at our 12 o'clock session. At 1 o'clock, we will have the Department of Education. And at 2 o'clock, Hawaii Tourism Authority. And before we start, I would like to apologize. We intended to have closed caption, but we are currently experiencing technical difficulties with closed cap captioning, and they may be unavailable during this live event. If we are unable to resolve it before or during the live stream, we will add the closed captioning and repost the recording as soon as possible. We sincerely apologize for this inconvenience. Um, with that, um, President Lasner, would you like to please come forward and do a report? Okay. And if I can invite up my okay. colleague, six feet away, Vice President Jan Govea. Um, Jan is the Vice President of David Lasner, President of the University of Hawaii. Jan Govea is the Vice President for Administration. And as part of her responsibilities, she is the lead executive for um, emergency management, including hurricanes, floods, and now she has learned pandemics as well. Um, so if you would like, we can address the specific questions that were noticed in the hearing. And I'll turn it over to Jan to lead off. And also with me today is the chair of our Board of Regents, uh, Benjamin Kudo Esquire, mm -hmm. who is also an essential personnel And along those lines, um, what the University of Hawaii has been doing uh, is obviously closely monitoring um, the status of the pandemic uh, statewide by participating in the daily uh, HIEMA calls. Um, but we also have daily officer calls um, to make sure that the entire university leadership team is current on status of what's happening locally um, and nationally um, and we're able to respond nimbly to um, whatever the situation presents. Um, as a working objective, what we have tried to stay consistent to from the beginning um, has been to ensure the um, continuation of the spring semester, um, that we want to be able to complete it and provide the credits um, as originally planned. Um, and we were anticipating um, ultimately that we get to a point where we would be kind of in this state of shutdown. Uh, and so we began pretty early on planning for online or distance learning. Um, and the faculty, we had to get a lot of um, the IT uh, components up and running, um, as well as working directly with faculty leadership to make sure that the um, curriculum would be able to be presented distantly. Um, that is definitely a different learning, deliver, uh, learning um, delivery method um, that everybody had to just kind of shift their mindset around. Um, and we were able to, over the course of a few weeks, get people mentally prepared to do that. Um, and we kicked that off on Monday, which is the return of the spring semester. Um, and based on yesterday, I mean, we were expecting to um, get a whole host of uh, inquiries from students and faculty, but we have not, um, we did not get bombarded with a lot of questions or concerns. So um, the, so far it's been, it's been pretty quiet in terms of ensuring the continuous and uninterrupted state of the spring semester. Um, there were one-off classes that still had face-to-face -face meetings. Um, those were either our laboratories or our CTE classes. Um, one week ago, uh, we were still planning on delivering those courses or classes 
I should say, face-to-face, -face, um, assuming that we could ensure a social distancing of six feet. Um, but in light of uh, Mayor Caldwell's and Governor Ige's um, announcements on Sunday and Monday, respectively, um, we have made the decision to discontinue um, at least any face-to-face -face straggling kind of classes that we were not able to deliver online. Um, in addition to um, our other activities on campus, like construction, those are continuing as scheduled. Um, we are also, uh, we have implemented a work from home program uh, and we have created forms and an approval process and we've now um, today just established an on uh, feature in our online leave system so that that all can be captured. Um, but ultimately, uh, we are in a little bit of a different situation, I think, than some other um, government entities where we, again, are trying to complete the spring semester. And so the goal is to, um, our essential workers are anybody that is necessary to make that happen. Um, so we are um, encouraging our employees to work from home. Um, where it can be done um, and where it cannot be done, we are limiting um, the level of service or the level of effort and our workforce size um, to more basic minimum levels so that uh, we can just kind of shift through uh, the work levels. So the intent is to continue providing business um, but at a descaled level because a lot of our students will be at home uh, and we are waiting to see, we, we did kind of put ourselves in wait and see mode to see how the spring break um, or the return from spring break would look like, what that would look like on our campuses. Um, and just based on Monday's um, experience, it, it feels like people are heeding the do not come to campus request. Um, it's, it's pretty low levels of activity, so we are beginning to slowly, continuously evaluate what is open and slowly and continuously kind of shut down, um, again, to be mindful of all the orders that are out there, but as well as our objective to complete the spring semester. So with that, I'll maybe end there and see if there's any specific questions. President Lesnar, do you have anything to add? Um, we have a presentation also, I, so we'll do her questions here. I'm happy to, um, I mean, I think the only thing I'd add is, is maybe to step back a little bit and say um, the balancing act for us has been how to complete the semester for our students while keeping everybody stay safe and navigating um, that balance always, we think, trying to keep both our students and our employees safe. Um, we have closed large numbers of our facilities already. We've closed our campuses to the public. And um, every day brings a new adventure in this. I don't think we've ever seen a crisis like this. And I've been around long enough to have been through um, floods, hurricanes, tsunami warnings, and the last financial crisis um, about 11 years ago. And this almost has all of it rolled into one, but with a change every day almost. Um, we're deeply engaged in the state's efforts as Jan uh, mentioned. Um, I participate in cabinet meetings with the governor and his team. Our emergency coordinator who reports to Jan is in all of the hyema calls. We communicate pretty relentlessly within the university. We have all become uh, pretty capable of using Zoom, I think, these days, which is our uh, video tool of choice. Um, and then we monitor the updates from both the Hawaii Department of Health as well as CDC, which don't always say the same things to us. They don't always update at the same time. So we're navigating um, those differences as well. Um, our commitment is to finish the semester online and we are constantly reevaluating. We made that announcement almost before anybody in the state was really getting serious about what was going to happen. 
and immediately Chaminade and HPU followed suit and, and, and there were other parts of the state um, that followed as well. Um, initially, we provided for a number of exceptions. We wanted our um, career and technical education courses to complete, if at all possible. Um, those would be like auto mechanics, pastry chef, and just yesterday we decided that risk was too high. So we pulled the plug on those courses which were being offered, which were to be offered starting yesterday face to face but with social distancing. But we just felt like we would rather err on the side of safety and try and help those students complete after the, the crisis passes. Um, one of the conversations we had with both Chaminade and HPU also was around residence halls as well. Um, we've talked about them a lot and um, we chose to keep them open because we have students, we have residence halls on two of our campuses, uh, UH Manoa and UH Hilo. Um, we have students who literally have nowhere to go. I mean, if you're a student from China, you can't go home right now. And if you go home, you'll never be able to come back, um, back into this country. So, um, and we have other students who um, have living situations such that they don't really have a place to go home either. Um, I would rather be in our dorm, our, sorry, our residence hall, I'm being trained, than return home to Seattle, New York, the Bay Area or not. They're in a safer place right now. Um, we have isolation rooms in those dorms. We have a couple of our students who have come back who are now in self-isolation. Those would be private rooms with bathrooms and we bring them food and they're participating in online classes and we expect that in 14 days they'll be able to rejoin um, the rest of the student body. We've shut down dining services on our campuses so it's all grab and go and delivery. We've canceled all of our public events. Um, Sadly, we have canceled all of our commencement and um, I will just tell you that every decision we make, um, we have both critics and fans for that decision. We have people who have been looking forward to graduation for four years who feel that we're now taking that opportunity away from them. Um, we will try to bring them back if it's safe at the end of the summer. We will offer them the opportunity perhaps for an in-person graduation, virtual graduations, our campuses are all thinking through that, but that's our highest priority right now is um, adjusting to um, what happened yesterday, which was the beginning of fully online courses for nearly 50,000 students and the 10,000 employees who support them. Um, we, we are taking a strong position on making sure people are home who we do not want on campus and you all have personally experienced what it's like um, when someone comes to work who shouldn't. So we're being very clear. Um, our first priority is if you shouldn't be at work, then don't come to work. So if you are ill, don't come to work. If you've come back from a place with widespread community transmission, don't come to work. If you have a household member who's tested positive, don't come to work. That's our first priority. Um, we're fortunate that so many of our workers can work from home, so if they're not actually sick, we can assign them duties. Um, but our first priority is getting them out of the workplace so that um, they don't endanger others. And then Jan has been, um, with her HR team, another area she's responsible for, has been working through the details of what does that mean. And I think, you know, we, we've been trying to be extremely agile. Um, our IT team, um, even without their former leader helping, um, has been amazing in things like, just starting over the weekend, we decided we had to adapt our online leave system to provide options for people who are not gonna be in the workplace, so we're able to track that. Um, adding capacity so that every one of our courses could go online instead of, normally we have less than 10% of our courses are online, um, and so far, um, nothing crashed yesterday. We had no um, catastrophic failures of technology. Um, we've upped our Zoom licenses, so our routine meetings like this are now conducted um, by telecommunications. Um, and our 
I just can't say enough about our people. You know, our faculty who have stepped up um, to make these changes, our students who have adapted to changes, um, our custodians who are sanitizing, um, as well as performing their duties. Um, I'll just say maybe in closing, you know, this is, um, I've had two really hard time things to deal with in my job, and this is certainly one of them, and this, this one is life and death. Um, so it's by far the most serious. Um, nobody in the university or the community is in touch. Um, it's it's gonna get harder, we know that, as the cases continue to increase. We're likely to see com you know more widespread community transmission before it settles down. Um, every decision we make is questioned. Um, we are continuously reevaluating and we're open to changing our path when we come to consensus about it. Uh, the leadership team has been remarkable and the, the formal officers of the University of Hawaii, um, we get together for an hour every morning to talk through what happened since yesterday um, because either something changed or we have a new um, challenge together. Um, what I will say is we are getting through this together and I know you hear from people who are unhappy with certain decisions we've made. Sometimes we change them, sometimes we don't. Um, we certainly hear from those people as well, but we're working hard to take care of each other. And I will say that um, in my job I get a lot of complaints about almost anything, um, probably even more than Senator Kim gets um, about us, I, I mean seriously. Um, but the complaints are coming in, in this situation, mostly in a kind manner. People really do appreciate how hard this is for everyone. So when they want a refund for something, they're asking, they're sharing their personal circumstances, some of which are just heartbreaking. Um, and, and we're all trying to do the best we can to get um, through it together. What gives me strength is that group of people that I work with, um, and also thinking about those students. So if we can get through this, we have several thousand students who will end this semester with a University of Hawaii degree and be able to move on into life, getting jobs to advance themselves, their families, and their communities. And um, if we can't succeed, then their lives all get put on hold for another semester or longer, depending on what they're studying. So uh, maybe with that, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Thank you for that, uh, President Lasner. I'm sure my colleagues and I agree that making decisions in uh, these times um, have been very difficult. And yes, you will have uh, people that are totally happy, totally unhappy, and somewhere in between. But the fact that you are making decisions with the uh, students um, in mind, um, at, at least I appreciate that because even here at the legislature, um, you know, we have not uh, been on the same uh, page with uh, some of the uh, decisions that governor has made or or not made. And uh, I get contacted every day from sometimes over and over from the same people or others about why we're not making those decisions and they don't understand it's not within our purview to do. With that, you did touch upon a, a couple of things that I would like to ask, and sure. one is the, uh, you talked about the dorms uh, remaining open, particularly for international mm -hmm. students who can't go home. Uh, with that in mind, what about the local students who can't go home? Are, it's, is if it they're in the dorms, there? they're welcome to stay. Okay. So we, um, um, we didn't drive anyone out. We didn't force anyone out of the dorms. That was a conscious decision. We're happy if people feel safer at home. We are eliminating our cancellation fees and we will do pro rata refunds of their room and board charges. Um, we're working through how to do that technically. It's not as easy as it sounds because it's part of a complicated um, financial system for students. Uh, but they are absolutely welcome to stay, um, especially neighbor island students who can't get back and forth that easily any longer. And so will they be expected to to pay additional funds if they were staying longer in the dorms? No, oh no, they've already booked for the dorm. So we didn't take in any new dorm residents, but
but this, the neighbor island students who are resident in the dorms, are, if they choose to stay through, they're welcome to. If they chose to go home, it was one of the reasons we announced early that we were gonna be online for the whole semester. Um, so they could make that decision over spring break as to whether they wanted to go home for the duration and stay there or if they wanted to um, stay in the dorms through spring break or come back after spring break. So it's their option. Thank you, and you talked about uh, refunds. Um, have you decided which refunds will be given? Athletic passes, et cetera, since? Um, so, the athletic, so athletics actually was ahead of the curve. Um, I am on the boards of both the Big West Conference and the Mountain West Conference, and we had multiple calls with the presidents of our member universities. Um, this is how fast it changed on the Wednesday of the Big West Basketball Tournament. We decided we were gonna go fan-free. The games would be played without fans. Two days later, the presidents came to the unanimous conclusion that it was too risky to even play and the tournament was canceled the day the games were to start. Um, and that's, that's just how dynamic this thing is. Um, and within three more days, basically the entire nation canceled all spring intercollegiate athletics. We have offered refunds to everyone for tickets that they have purchased. We have asked them if they're willing to help us out by taking that as a credit into next year and a, a, a large percentage, it's very gratifying. Um, some have even written in and said, consider it a donation, things will be hard. And some have said, I'll take it as a credit. Um, I think it was, I haven't checked the numbers lately, but it was in you know, the range of about half who actually asked for their money back and we we're happily refunding it. We are not refunding tuition. It is our intent to deliver a University of Hawaii education to every student who stays with us through the semester, and that's what we are focused on. You, but you, you said that for the CTE, we have to cancel yeah. those, so what about those? Yeah, I, I'm, we made that decision yesterday morning. Uh, I'm not exactly sure yet. Usually what we do is we make the decision in the name of safety, and then we try to figure out exactly how we will deal with it. Our goal is really to help those students finish. So if they are willing to come back when we can offer in-person instruction, our preference would be to allow them to complete their semesters. They were basically half through them. We would let them okay. complete so, for so free. So they will get first choice, is that what you're Oh, absolutely. We will make sure they have their chance. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? President John, thank you folks very much. Um, certainly you folks have acted and have um, made the tough decisions, as you said, you know, you're gonna get criticized no matter what you do. But I think that, um, you know, putting the classes online and working as fast as you did is, is very good to see. And, and hopefully this exercise, if we can see any silver lining, is looking at how we can streamline our um, operations as we go into the future, because this has been something that everybody's come together with. Um, you know, like my colleagues, we have been getting a lot of calls and, you know, they think that I can tell you what to do. Um, but I, I think the issue about the dorms, um, you know, emails to me saying why are they keeping the dorms open and what, what are the um, protocols. And so I'm glad you went over that. I think one of the questions I have is who's actually monitoring that they're not, you know, having parties in the dorms, that they're not congregating uh, because all, Everything that we've seen is that the the younger generation seems to not be taking this as seriously as as the rest, and so um, you know parties during spring break, stuff like that. I mean, how are you handling it um, in the dorms? I haven't walked the dorms myself yet, um, so but our number of residents is down because of the number who um, chose to complete the semester. How many chose to leave? By the way, I, I don't have the accurate number right now. I, I'll, I can get that and we'll follow up with that at, at both Manoa and Hilo. Um, one of our commitments also has been to try to maintain employment for our students and graduate assistants. Um, you know, we had a heartbreaking story from a student, um, one of our hourly undergraduate student employees, and the supervisor said, I don't have work for you. And the student said, 
my parents have both been laid off in hospitality. This is the only income we have. Um, so we're trying to keep all of our students employed. So we have resident advisors in the dorms as well as the staff. And this is part of what they have to do with the new rigor. I will say in this, um, just this day and a half since we've been back from spring break, um, campus is dead. Um, I mean, there aren't people wandering around, Which hooping and hollering, okay. and that's what we want. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, yeah, you just don't see people, and and I, I'll double check on protocols in the dorms, but okay. um, yeah, they just we tend not to be recognized as a party school in general on those national surveys, and you yeah. know for that I'm very grateful. I guess not so much as like partying, but you know when you're. A friends right next door and you're right. isolated and you know tendency is let's come over have some pizza together whatever so I, I just think that Thank we, you. we need yeah. to, you know I, that's what people are like telling I'm going to assure them that we, we're doing that the other uh, question is travel um, how are you dealing with travel and non-essential travel we, what, what is um, essential when we started we took this from a health perspective and we banned um, all travel to level three countries pretty close to immediately. We discouraged all um, non-essential travel. And since then, as the health consequences of travel became more serious, we have now banned all non-essential travel, including inter-island. Um, we're making much better use of um, teleconferencing for almost all of our meetings. So what are you considering essential travel? Uh, I have not yet approved any essential travel since these bans went into effect. Does it all come through you or do they go no, through it, the particular department head? It goes things? now. Um, we are using the officers of the University of Hawaii as the tipping point. So that's the, um, the system vice presidents, the chancellor of West Oahu in Hilo, and the provost of UH Manoa, vice president for community colleges, um, have to approve travel. And so among, among them, have you folks come to some kind of a consistency as to what you're considering essential travel? So we, when we meet daily, um, we try to bring these issues up so that we ensure consistency. So far, nobody's raised it. We haven't really had to force the definition of what is essential. Um, I think so far, uh, nobody's requested it. So it hasn't escalated. I mean, people are pretty scared. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we yeah. just want to make sure because we find that it's the travelers that are bringing it in or, yeah. you know, going out and coming back with it. So, so our, um, our guidelines, this is easy for me to say, but it's a little harder to implement. But anybody who returns from a place with, even before the governor's order, anybody who returns from a place with widespread community transmission, we were asking them to um, self-quarantine for 14 days a week or so ago. Now that problem is kind of gone because of the governor's order um, that everyone who comes here from anywhere, regardless of you know, resident, non-resident, has to self-quarantine for 14 days. So I don't know why anyone would go on any kind of business trip at this point. Mm -hmm. I just hope that people also understand the difference between self-quarantine and stay-at-home eating because... Yeah, you don't want to infect your family while you're at home. Both is different, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, one you can go to get food and stuff and right. another one is you're, you're just not allowed to leave right. a room, isolated yeah. room. Um, the other final question I have is uh, I know the faculty had some concerns about um, the online, have that been dealt with and yeah, resolved? We, um, or the unions, rather, not Yeah, so we, um, I, I, I want to thank our unions. I mean, they've really been great through this. Um, we have erred on the side of making um, decisions, so we did make the decision to go online initially for three weeks. Um, UPA expressed their displeasure to us. Okay and um, we resolved it in one meeting together. Uh, very positive. Um, through that process, we established a joint working group of UPA members appointed by UPA and um, university executives. Um, 
the reports I get, I'm not part of that group, but the reports I get from both UPA um, and UH are that the group has been extraordinarily effective and positive in working through the issues. And um, I think everybody knows this is the only way our students are going to get an education. So the you know, concerns, people are, are really positively solving problems. When we issued our initial work at home mm -hmm. orders and HG members thought it was going too slowly and reached mm -hmm. out to Randy Pereira, he has reached out to, to Jan and I to express concerns that he's hearing about the slowness, perceived slow, mm -hmm. slowness of processing work at home um, processes. So we're trying to be really responsible so we don't just say, oh, go off and work at home. We're asking the employees and the supervisors to come to not a complicated agreement, but some understanding of what will be taking place while that person's working from home and being paid, frankly. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not as simple as, you know, see you in three weeks. It's, uh, but in the meantime, we, we send them home while we work through that too. So as far as, and I'm sorry, one more question. As far as the online, and trying to get the students graduated. Now, if something happens where it, the order is lifted or whatever, are you going to continue that? You're going to finish up on the uh, online or well switch I, over? Because I think it's going to be That's chaotic. the happiest question that friends <laughs> ask me. <laughs> uh, boy, I don't know. I, yeah, I, we I think probably we would to, offer that option. I mean, if everything were lifted and somebody um, were to announce, well, I guess, President Trump sort of announced maybe social distancing doesn't need to take, I didn't, well, I think I it's didn't listen to him, but yeah. if, if it were lifted and, every, and somebody were to say before the end of the semester, everything's fine, go back to normal, we would go back to normal. Okay, because I think it'll be in stages, but yeah. I'm just wondering, is it going to be too chaotic to go from online then back to classes, you know, and, and, and the uncertainties. We, we need to take a day to, you know, get everybody back to right. custodians and Yeah, so you might want to think about like it. We're, we've been asking. That's a happy question. Thank yeah, you. we've been asking um, department heads to look at the recovery. What would the recovery yeah. look like and um, how we would yeah. deal with that? So if that's uh, something you can look at, that would be. I mean, there are some students who, um, you know, aren't from here. And so when they went home for spring break, they stayed home because they knew that we were going to be offering online classes throughout the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. So if there is this happy day, we would probably, you know, figure out how to negotiate that. Hi both. Hybrid is Hybrid. The, the word we use yeah. yeah, in distance learning circles. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, good. So we, we would not want to keep the local students or the students who are here, we would want to restore the face-to-face -face experience as soon as we can. But yeah. Okay. Good point, Jan. Yeah, that's good. That's why we talk about all this stuff before <laughs> we do it. Yeah, and that's what we want to make sure yeah. that we're we're ready when yeah. and if the time comes yeah. that we can transition smoothly, yeah. um, bring everybody back. Yeah. Okay. That's one we hadn't thought about. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. So does that mean that maybe there could be a graduation, a po the <laughs> not. The yeah. traditional one, but maybe something. Yeah, we, we've out. been talking about whether we do something mm -hmm. virtual. Um, I was on a call this morning. One of the good things about our time zone is when the presidents of public universities do events, they'll do like noon Eastern, so I can get up at six before my day starts. And it was on with a uh, hundred plus um, university presidents around the country, and most of them are going to some sort of virtual graduation just to give those students some kind of experience to complete you know, what they've been through. So we're, we're noodling that um, and, and then give them the option of coming back in person as well to our next ceremony. But nothing special like maybe a July graduation if things turn That's out? I mean, to, to we, we might do summer. We, we used to do summer graduations at Manoa and we might try to adopt that for other campuses as well. Mm -hmm. Manoa is the hardest one because it's so big, right. especially spring graduations mm -hmm. where we have thousands of students graduating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, President. Uh, really appreciate all that you've done so far since last week, I think. Uh, so I really appreciate. Uh, the, the question I have is more in terms of, of this the spread uh, and making sure that, that there is a policy and monitoring, as, as Senator Kim had mentioned. Um, what are you doing in the congregate spaces, like the libraries? Is the medical staff on board? 
to help the students who are staying in the dorms or who are coming onto campus and what kinds of uh, protocols are there so that we protect the students who do come and the research assistants who do come on board. Uh, what are we doing to protect their um, health? So, so the furniture like, um, like this, we just make it available every six feet. We remove a bunch of chairs and a bunch of tables from the study spaces um, to force the six foot social distancing um, parameters. Uh, we've also closed any, you know, all of our restaurants, no in. Um, so everything's grab dining. and go. So they just everything's pick up grab and, and go everything's or take grab out. No yeah. contact. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, no eating together. And the research labs, you close that down for like the grad students and research that's going No, on. but we've, um, you know, in general, the instructional labs are the ones where people were closer together. The, if you've seen, you know, sort of the research labs, they tend to have um, workstations that are mm -hmm. already spaced six feet apart. Yeah. Um, we're very grateful, I will say, both the mayor and the governor um, gave us the flexibility in their emergency orders to do what we had to do to complete our semester online, including critical research. So we have experiments that you can't stop or you might lose years of work. Mm -hmm. And we had that um, ability to do that um, while practicing social distancing to the maximum possible. And we, we were grateful and we take what the trust they have placed in us seriously to, to follow through with that. And on the objective, I like your objective, having all the students graduate. What what percentage, or is it going to be all of them? And can you can you actually well, have the class? I mean, I'll give you an example them? of the kind of thing that comes up, and it's coming up here as well as nationally that we're working through. But both students and faculty who have been this um, forced into an online mode that many of them really weren't prepared for. Um, surprisingly, not all of our students felt prepared either. We always think it's going to be the faculty because they're older, but, but it's some of both. And some of our faculty are amazing leaders in this and, and helping each other. But um, they put in requests to be able to take classes pass-fail rather than for a letter grade to lower the stress on performance. And it turns out this is happening all across the country. So we're looking at... Um, those kinds of changes to really help more of our students graduate. You know, in 10 years when somebody looks at their transcript, nobody's going to care mm -hmm. that in this one semester all they had was passes instead of A's and B's. And the and faculty are on board in terms of Some of the, the faculty have requested that also, but mm -hmm. we go through a consultation process and so far so good. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. So in uh, going back to the dorms, do we have any kind of dorm check? Not so much to see if they're partying, like partying or keeping their distance, but to make sure that they're safe and OK, because it's so secluded, probably. I did not ask that question this morning. Yeah, so I will say this. Um, the dorms are definitely on our radar. Um, and especially for our chancellors um, who know that it is a place where we have congregation happening. Um, the, the resident hall managers, I should say, um, <laughs> have all been very um, consciously um, aware of the social distancing and what we are trying to enforce at the dorm, at the room level. Um, we are keeping track of where everybody is returning from uh, we are keeping track of symptoms if there's anybody, you know, so that so that there is this um, very regular interaction between uh, UH employee staff um, and the residents. The exact <coughs> methodology for doing that, I'm not completely aware of, but I feel confident in saying that the management of the residence halls are, are very closely monitoring all of the residents. I mean, we, we, we've identified this as um, maybe the riskiest de yeah. decision that we made. I mean, we, we do appreciate that, and we wanted to take care of our students. And I will say, when I talked with um, the president of Chaminade and told her what we were thinking, she said, thank you, that's what we want to do too. 
but it's hard if we're the 900 pound gorilla and we go one way. Mm -hmm. It has implications for Chaminade and HPU as well. So all the staff across the whole um, system um, in the dorms, um, my, well, I guess it's just Big Island. Just the two. Um, yeah. Are all trained and know what social distance is and, and what uh, disinfecting. It's, I mean, I think that's the messaging we've been putting out to the whole university. You know, pretty much stay home if you're sick, <laughs> um, wash your hands, mm -hmm. and stay six feet away from other people. So if no they find gathering. somebody who's sick, I mean, what, how do they deal with that? Do they have a protocol we, for that if somebody is sick? We try to get them to their doctor. Yeah, I mean, we're not, we don't have major medical care facilities. We have a, a clinic, but. Um, but we have, we have identified isolation yeah. rooms. So yeah. there is um, a place to go. It's a, it's a, it's yeah. a wing that we were going to renovate. Um, and so for, that's been identified as where anybody would need to go for either isolation or some kind of. And you haven't had so any problems so far? Not no. yet. Nothing. So, and, and actually, let me add, because I know they're coming before you in a couple hours. Um, this weekend, I reached out to um, both HTA and HLTA, um, Chris and Mufi, and asked for help, mm -hmm. because we didn't know if we were going to need more rooms or not. And um, they got us in touch, because they've been meeting with all of the hotel um, operators. They got us in touch with... Um, one of the hotel operators who basically said, let us know if you need rooms and we can provide single rooms with bathrooms. And then we would have just had to arrange to get them you know, food and online access there. But so far we've not had to do that. So you've, um, you're not full in your, your dorms? No, not right now because, yeah. So everybody's, yeah, you've people got have Stacey. left. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If we were at 100%, it would have been tricky because we wouldn't have had single rooms okay. free to use for the isolation. I think in, in asking about the dorm checks, I'm um, not, not as much concerned about them self-identifying and letting you guys know that they're sick or going to uh, uh, an isolation room. But for those, particularly the international students um, from China and those that were have where the, the communities have the widespread disease, mm -hmm. is that um, should they get sick and no one know and no mm -hmm. one's seen them for a while because yeah. no one's checking, um, that's what I think I'm afraid of. Okay. So if, if you can ask your resident yeah. managers just to do a knock on the door, you know, take a step back and wait for something, just, yeah. just so that the residents know there will be a check yeah. to make sure that they are okay. and on. On that line, are you also uh, fully staffed with security? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, we've actually um, experienced an increase in homelessness, um, you know, on our campuses um, because of, I guess, all the parks are closing and things of that nature. Um, some extra signs of vandalism. So we uh, we are definitely at, you know, being fully staffed. We've all, we've also had to double up on all of our patrols, uh, just, just given everything. Um, one of the challenging um, parts to <coughs> security right now is keeping that six foot distance when you come upon you know, a person. Um, and so they are um, protocols in place where we try to, as much as possible, maintain that distance and having two officers on every scene um, assists with that. Thank you. Other questions? I have a final one. This is a tough question. Is to your budget. I mean, with everything going on, the refunds and, and everything else that you have to deal with as far as it's something that you're looking at, because hopefully we will at some point get back as well and we'll have to look at you know, what we're facing as far as that. So um, I don't know if priorities need to be re-looked at and re-evaluated. Yeah, um, I was but hoping we wouldn't go there today, but yeah. um, I mean, I'm not asking. I you started. To I'll, go there, I'll just tell you because it. Um, I told our team as we're working through these things like pass fail and what kind of leave do we use when we send them home if they're working or not working. My uh, because everyone's doing so well with that. My brain has shifted to exactly where yours is because I was here for the 2009 crash when we took pretty severe cuts from the legislature, followed by 
pretty severe cuts from uh, executive restrictions um, and the federal stimulus, which I'm tracking that bill really closely to try to understand. And we've, we've asked all four of our congressional delegation to please do what they can for higher education in that bill because we didn't get made whole through that. Um, we are absolutely beginning to talk about the tough times ahead. And we hope you will be supportive, but we know you're gonna be in a tough spot too. Um, and I think it's gonna be a really difficult next year for the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we had, and I, I think Chair um, Dela Cruz is on. You see a little DC on the screen. <laughs> yes. um, but he had reached out to us just before you adjourned and asked for information about um, budget reductions. Mm -hmm. And I, we're not so naive as to believe that when you come back, that will all be off the table. If anything, it's gonna be harder given what's about to happen to our economy, so. I mean, already the UH, we had concerns about some areas, um, certain budgets, I know the community college, community, uh, Kapiolani Community College, so there were already concerns as to how much money we had in your reserve, so-called reserve, that really not a reserve. So with all of that going on, yep. I know that's, that's- We're looking through all of that. Okay. We had, I think when I was here last, we talked about our six-year rolling plans, and pretty much our six-year rolling plans are now out the window. You know, we did not expect this. And we know it will be consequential and difficult and we're trying to frame it in ways that will help us come out stronger mm -hmm. to meet the needs of the state moving forward. But it's going to be hard. And, and as I said op when I first spoke, was that you know we, we need to look at um, the silver lining and maybe again how we become more efficient, how we can streamline areas. Now more than ever is a time that we can probably look at that mm -hmm. um, and get the everybody involved uh, more on the same page than ever before. So. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you folks being here today. Thank you, okay. um, thank you both. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge that um, the chair of the region, Ben Kudo, is here and would like to allow him time to say something if he has anything to. Yes. Thank you, Senator Kidani and members of the special committee. Uh, it's been a very trying situation for everyone, and I want to thank uh, Dave uh, Lasner and the uh, administra administration's uh, leadership team for uh, making the day and dealing with the day-to-day -day decisions They're very difficult. Um, the regents uh, have also faced uh, the same situation with regard to conducting business, and we have uh, deadlines that we um, uh, are mandated to take action on, and dealing with them in, in the current situation has become problematic for us. However, we are able through the use of technology, uh, given the suspension of the Sunshine Law, and that's something that I hope that the uh, legislature might want to consider is putting in a permanent provision in the Sunshine Law that says that whenever a situation such as this arises, there is an automatic suspension of those rules which really tie the hands of boards and commissions like us from uh, trying to adapt to absentee uh, participation. Uh, that would really facilitate uh, our conducting business and pr pursuing what we need to do. Um, we already had one meeting uh, this month and um, uh, out of the 12 uh, regions, uh, seven were uh, done remotely. Uh, things worked out quite well and as a senator, uh, um, Kim knows, uh, you know, the uh, bill with regard to audiovisual and uh, 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 broadcast of our meetings uh, had already started, at least with regard to the audio. Unfortunately, we were able to audio stream those meetings. Uh, hopefully, at some point down the, f down the road, we will be able to also add the uh, video portion of it as well. Um, and um, we, right now, as, as I speak, but things are changing there daily, we are anticipating to go forward with our April meeting, which is one of the more important meetings that we have upcoming um, uh, in terms of conducting business. But uh, anyway, I wanted to thank all of you for your patience and, and for 
uh, the administration and the students and faculty and others and the stakeholders of the university for uh, understanding and uh, you know we haven't had too many complaints about what is going on because I think everybody is empathetic to the current situation is trying their best to uh, conduct business and move forward but thank you very much thank you I have a question yes. yeah. thank you Ben I just wanted to um, know whether or not um, you or anyone else on the regents are part of your daily meetings are you folks we, we are kept abreast uh, Dave, Dave uh, communicates with me on a regular basis with regard to some of the major decisions that have to be made and also gives me a heads up when things are coming down that uh, will, will be announced or, or hit the news. So, and then I also I think it's important pose that, questions that to him. You, a representative or yourself should be part of your... The board secretary is on those calls. So she's actually an officer of the university as well. Okay. But yeah, because yeah, I think it's important that the regents know as things are happening and not later as to what's going Correct. on, right? Because ultimately, you folks are the... We're, we're responsible. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. And before you. Uh, you leave, I believe our um, chair of our committee, Senator De La Cruz, may have some questions. Yeah, I just had one quick question. You know, I think I share the committee's um, thankfulness and everything you've done to try to as things settle, how do you plan to approach looking at the diversification of the economy so that we can start to treat people and get out of this slum a lot sooner than um, what some people think the timeline actually is? Yeah, I, I think um, the two most important things that we do are to educate students so that they can participate both by getting jobs and you know this is this is the time when more than ever before we're going to see the um, the challenges associated with allowing ourselves to become so dependent on tourism as, as you know better than anyone senator um, and we need to keep educating people for other kinds of jobs we also need to keep educating uh, people with around innovation and entrepreneurship so that they aren't just um, trying to get jobs, but they're thinking about creating jobs. And I think um, we're working very hard to preserve our research enterprise, which is a big part of what we do, and it's a significant driver in the economy. Um, thousands of jobs are created in Hawaii because of the dollars that UH brings in from other places. And we need to be very careful to ensure that we don't kill that uh, while everything else is going on as well. Um, we have been part, as you know, of conversations around the shift into tech for so long, and we continue to try to support that. And I think if there are other strategic directions identified by the, stra by the state, I would hope we're there at the table with everyone. Um, from my perspective, whatever way we want to go as a state, we cannot succeed without the University of Hawaii being part of that and taking our students to be the foundation of that future. So I, I welcome when you're um, back off of quarantine, maybe we can get together and talk about it from six feet apart. <laughs> <laughs> I know the committee, once, once things are uh, a lot more stable, there's more consistency in communication, it's, then we can start to change our direction into focusing on how we can improve the economy and, and rebound a lot faster. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a five-minute break so we can sanitize the uh, not that you guys are dirty. No, uh, we sanitize it for you. <laughs> thank you. Be assured. And thank you.
didn't change. <laughs> you look it like looks you're like you're working. Work. We did breakfast distribution this morning, so I joined some of the folks. Okay, so we can, you can, you know, if you want to talk about that in your presentation. You okay. okay. So we're reconvening our Senate COVID-19 task force, and um, it is now 210. We are here with our superintendent, Christina Kishimoto from the Department of Education. Thank you for being here. Aloha, thank and you. Please proceed with whatever presentation you'd like to give us today, and we'll ask questions right after. Okay, thank you. so I'll give an update. Um, as you know, this is fast changing, uh, and is. Uh, we're, we're working hard to, to keep up. I do wanna um, start off by saying that uh, we have a couple assumptions we're using. One is that this is the new normal for now, and, and we're gonna have fast changing uh, decisions, uh, but we're gonna be planful in how we execute those communications so that we don't create more confusion around what's happening. Uh, we do assume that uh, instruction is and will continue to be interrupted um, to a certain extent, but that all of us in the DOE, we have 44,000 employees that serve 180,000 students, which includes our charter schools who are working with us in, in all decision making, that uh, we will um, uh, continue to work cohesively uh, and uh, provide us as much of the services and supports that we can provide, including um, instructional enrichment. So we don't want students to be stepping away from learning for an extended period of time, because we know that will have other implications on how we make up that, that time completely. So we are focused on not the typical uh, instructional design, but certainly enrichment. Uh, we had a three week period we had planned, which is we were on spring break. We extended spring break by a week, uh, which was uh, this week, uh, in order for teachers to have a week of planning uh, so that they can plan out what a multifaceted instructional approach would look like. Uh, students would then be engaged using uh, technology and other means starting next week. Uh, and then we would be back in schools on April 7th. Uh, we know that with changing circumstances and we know this might happen, uh, we would need to extend that time period. So as of uh, this, uh, just a few minutes ago actually, this early afternoon, I've issued that extension. Uh, that has happened after having about 24 hours of meetings, intensive meetings with my leadership team to, to plan out what that looks like. We've extended the, the closure of school buildings through April 30th, uh, which means that uh, instruction will not occur during that time, but we have um, uh, uh, sent out a notice to uh, parents, community members, saying that there are some things that will happen. The public school system remains open. We will be teleworking. Um, during that teleworking time, we're providing uh, as much uh, in terms of breakfast and lunch, food services to support our ohana, uh, and making sure that our children are, are receiving food. 50% of our students live at or below the poverty level, so we wanna be able to extend this. Uh, we are also, and we're providing that at 40 school sites. Uh, as of the uh, end of this week, we'll have 40 school locations. We'll continue to expand upon that as we continue to look at demand um, on those food resources and other places that we could potentially provide that. We're also looking at and standing up a, um, an e-system that allows uh, parents and kids to go online to get instructional resources, to go on virtual field trips, to do reading online. But we also know we have students who don't have access online, and so we're also working through what it means to print out packets by grade level uh, banding and um, how we would distribute those packets uh, in a staggered manner starting next week and then continuing the following week. So one thing I will report is our teachers and staff are working really hard to make sure that we can keep some aspects as normalized as possible. What's important is, especially as we think about, we have 3,000 students um, who are homeless or houseless. And we also have students who are living in temporary home situations. We don't wanna lose track of them. We wanna know where they are. We wanna be able to provide supports. We wanna give them materials to use, keep them in positive spirits, and also have a good understanding if they need social emotional supports or health supports that we can either link them with those supports or provide those directly, which means that we need to continuously look at 
how we're providing those services. I think there's some confusion around uh, the DOE not shutting down. I want to be clear, our schools are always going to be aligned with state and, uh, and county mandates around how to ensure a healthy space and social distancing. Uh, but we, uh, while we're announcing always that an alignment with those decisions, we also want to make sure that we're also announcing that we are open as a system, maximizing supports where we can provide those and be available to the counties and to, to other decision makers where we need OHANA support even beyond what a school system might typically provide. Uh, so I will say that we have also um, finalized and have been working under a, a statement of work, uh, which uh, it's required of all public school systems in this, in this nation, and, and, and we have a, a great statement of work that also identifies ways in which we are answering things like how we're gonna meet graduation requirements, what we're doing around assessments, what we're doing around dual credit, which will be incomplete because we uh, won't be able to finish those curriculum, uh, special ed services, English language learner services, what we're doing for vulnerable students, what we're doing around Hawaiian immersion, uh, how we're executing on early learning, uh, what does elementary, middle, and high school look like, how are we providing alternative learning settings, and how are we providing social emotional supports. So these are very detailed areas of um, Kuleana that we have, that we are going through very systematically and adding um, at, or, or changing as conditions change, uh, knowing that we have tremendous responsibility. And so when I say the school system is open, it means we're all working. It does not mean that a school building is open. It does not necessarily mean that a school, a student has to report to school or that teachers are reporting to a school site. So there is a difference between the system being open and schools being open. I'll stop there just to know exactly um, what other additional uh, details um, you would like to, um, to know at this time and answer those questions unless there are some areas that you want me to broadly go into. Um, so, Superintendent, just so that you know, we do have um, Chair De La Cruz online, live streaming, and uh, Senator Favela, and I'm not sure who the others are. But Jared, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, if they have questions, they, they will uh, pipe in. Sorry. I had a couple questions, and uh, some of the emails that I had were really around the fact that you just talked about um, the um, April 7th report to school uh, previous uh, requirement uh, set out by the Department of Education and uh, thank you for your discussion on that and there was a letter that went home to parents today yes uh, noting that the school uh, is still will still be closed to students until um, April 30th at least, and that is a moving target depending on uh, what uh, we get from our, our governor and counties as far as keeping things closed. Correct. Um, the other question I had was related to the picture that was, I think, in uh, yesterday morning's paper um, where um, the uh, DOE cafeteria workers and I, I think maybe other DOE employees were preparing the grab and go, but they were not using gloves. So um, just wanted, the comment was that, just wanted to make sure that, um, that it is, uh, that we look at preparing the foods using gloves and all the precautions possible but you know I want to thank the Department of Education uh, for doing the grab and go because we do know that um, without that there are many children that are not going to have breakfast or, or lunch because of their their uh, circumstances so I, I do appreciate that um, thank you Senator. I did have um, I sent Randy Tanaka a question because apparently and I it, I did not see uh, Kipapa Elementary on the list but apparently someone thought it was on the list previously and is no longer on the list. Uh, Randy's response was that it didn't meet federal requirements, but he was going to uh, reevaluate it again. So I, I do appreciate that he's taking the time to look at it. I, I um, know how busy you guys are right now, and 
Can I add to that? Sure. Because I, I think one of the things that's important for everyone to understand, including the general public, is that the uh, we, we fall under the federal requirements because we get reimbursed for these meals. Uh, and that's important, although the because of the emergency situation we're in and because they basically allowed us to use the summer feed uh, requirements, we don't have to have anyone prove that they're eligible for Title I. Anyone 18 years or, or younger can come to a food site and pick up a meal. And so we're feeding our children across the board. We had this morning, I was at one of the feeding sites, uh, and we're, we've been checking in. Uh, uh, one is making sure our staff are doing well and, and, and uh, we really appreciate their time uh, in doing this. The other is just checking in with community and asking them how they're doing, um, chatting with kids, again, encourage them and teaching them about social distancing and so that, that's important to do. Uh, what uh, the federal requirements um, uh, also stipulate is uh, the feeding program and the extent of it depends on how many meals were distributed the, the previous few days. So we just started yesterday, which means that's actually the start. Uh, we uh, saw that we um, are, were close to what we provided, which means that today in many spa areas we doubled up. And so if uh, if those or all, all those meals are picked up, then tomorrow we can add and that's the way that happens if they don't get picked up then we have to cut back uh, we have continued to apply to the feds for um, other considerations for example we have some kids who are under protective custody or in situations where we need to protect their identities and so we've we filed for um, emergency consideration that we could provide those meals to those families without having the, the child exposed by showing up at the site. A child has to pick up the food and the federal regulation. So we continue to file based on what is happening and the demands and what our community needs. So we're just asking for patience. Uh, we got some comments today on social media that unfortunately were not very positive, although most of our comments were positive, but they were based on one day of distribution. So I said, you know, let's, let's be patient, we will keep adjusting, and we will keep filing for exemptions based on what we need in Hawaii. Each state is allowed to file for exemptions based on what their community needs. So we're really excited about this at McKinley. Uh, breakfast, 60 breakfast um, were, uh, meals were picked up yesterday morning, today 115 minutes. And so if it escalates, we're ready for it. So we'll, we'll keep upping that, and we'll also keep track of who's showing up the important matter for us is if you have means, you have a family member who can drive you and you can pick up your meal, uh, that's fantastic. But we're also paying attention, if you don't have means, do we have our students who, who, who don't have access? How, do they, how are they getting it? Are they walking to the school? Do we need to look at other distribution sites? So we'll continue to make modifications uh, day over day over day. Thank you for that clarification. So. Um, what I just heard you say, so any child 18 and younger can go to one of the school sites and pick up a grab-and-go. Yes, they don't have to be a public school student and they don't have to prove that they have need. Thank you for that clarification. That's yes. really um, awesome to know. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? How do you then protect the whole, that you don't run out for the kids who really need it versus people taking advantage of the system? And, the, you know, in this time, we see that gouging and hoarding and stuff like that. Well, we can only provide the meal to a child's hands, so adults can't show up and say, I have children at home, right? So we want to make sure that it is getting into the hands of kids, mm -hmm. and we can make immediate changes one day to the next. So if we see an uptick, like we saw at McKinley with um, breakfast today, by tomorrow they, make, they add meals. Uh, so and, and until that meal count is within the range of, of the average, uh, we keep um, adding or subtracting. So a child can go from pick up point to pick up point and, and pick up more than one? We do not track, we don't have a sign in. Uh, we have found even national data shows that it averages out where we're, meet, we're meeting community needs. And so we're not worried if there's you know a few families or kids who go from one site to another site. 
Um, that's not what we're worried about. That's not typically what we're seeing. Um, and we, our feeding um, schedule is it's really tight. Um, and so we have a line of cars this morning at our school sites already, and we have walkers. The walkers get uh, attended very quickly and first, and then the line of cars um, roll up, and the kids come out of the cars, and they're the ones that pick up their meals. Okay, just want to make sure that the meals go to the people who actually really need it. I agree. Yeah. And yes. we don't, you know, put out a system where we can be taken advantage of and therefore people will suffer because of that. So. I've given the Heads Up Center to a few partners, like private partners, that if we need to go into spaces or locations um, that we don't typically get into and we need help delivering meals into those spaces, it does have to be done by our staff, but if we can borrow buses or equipment to make that happen, and so we have on standby some private um, partners uh, to help us if we need to extend um, to our neediest communities. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is, um, um, I think, a concern that Senator Kim brought up. I, I do realize, though, that for the greater good to make sure all students are able to um, have a grab and go, for the few that are trying to gain gain the system, we just cannot let that um, stop us from um, getting the meals to those students that, that really need it. And for those who are doing that kind of stuff, you know, shame on you, shame on you. Any other questions? Um, just the other side, you say that 50% of the students are in poverty level. So on the other side of it, how are you tracking the students to make sure that they are having their meals um, from the schools? Are you tracking the students themselves? No, we don't have a way of tracking the students, especially because of how the delivery is supposed to occur. Um, and so with, with the, it's a much more open system using the summer feed approach, which we like because we can feed any child coming in. Uh, our principals, though, um, are at these school sites or other leaders who know the kids, and they're keeping track of mm -hmm. who's showing up, who their neediest kids are, whether they're showing up or not, and then they're giving feedback to our food services team around, uh, you know, we're not really getting to a certain subset of our population that we know live in a certain neighborhood or certain area. And so how do we start to think about pushing food into those areas? And, and in that regard, how to keep track or in contact, you're doing a lot of things online, but. And, and how do you get to those students who probably are the neediest uh, to keep them connected with the school? Yes, yeah, so our priority over the next 30 day period with this 30 day extension is for uh, teachers and staff to be reaching out to families uh, and school by school there individually, that's the best way to do it, is that each school is keeping track of which families or which children are responding, which are getting online, which are picking up uh, packets, who do we get, need to get packets to, again, to just touch bases with our children and make sure that one, they know where there are resources, especially around food, but also that we can just touch bases with them and, and check in on them. Yeah, so you don't lose track. Yeah, and the priority is our, our students in crisis, right? Before this even started, we, had our, we have our list of students in crisis. We have our students who receive medical services, um, social, emotional, psychological services, uh, students who are not living with family members or are in emergency uh, home placements. Those are our priorities in terms of um, getting in touch with them. So the special education students, are they coming on campus or are they also at home? How so they're not that? coming on campus. Uh, what we are looking at is, and, and everyone in the nation is struggling with this, I'm on a network of the large urban superintendents as well as all the state superintendents, and we're sharing practices with one another and ideas. Everyone right now is struggling and working with U.S. Department of Ed around how to provide special ed services. Um, undoubtedly, uh, we will, at the end of a shutdown period like this, where we can't provide direct services for all students who need those services, we need to look at how we make up uh, that time and those services. At the same time, we're looking at are there ways in which we can use some spaces where kids do need services that require one-on-one -on -one, uh, so that we also don't have children that need to then go to a hospital setting or a medical setting to get those services. Occupational therapy, physical therapy are medically fragile. So we have students with conditions that, uh, that need those physical 
uh, supports in order to uh, 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 be successful in other functions in life. And so really our work is gonna be getting special ed teachers in touch with families to see what they would like to have now and what they would like to wait on. So right now they're at home. At all students all are at home, at home, all teachers, everyone is at home, yes. Yeah. Superintendent, I um, have a question related to, um, so in your um, letter to um, parents and guardians um, talking about the um, school being closed until at least April 30th, but also uh, talking about uh, providing packets and giving um, um, an online s site where they can navigate and the children can be um, supported. What happens to those children who don't have computers and don't have access to internet? That's what the, um, the instructional packets are for. They're in place of so, the internet. Okay, right. so, so those students will get the packets. Right. And other students who are able to connect will just get- We'll have the resources online. Okay. Yes. And they, so this site that you provided in this letter is the site that they're supposed to go to? No, no, this is a site that's in the letter that's for parents around uh, ways in which they can support their child's continuous learning and then they will have access to uh, and get additional links where they'll have access to online uh, learning sites. So schools already have online learning sites that they use during the school year, mm -hmm. some more than others. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is put them all together so there's a whole cadre of resources. Teachers are working this week to provide guidance to their students around where to go to get access and then when they can't have access, what their packet looks like. So how are the students um, or when do the students go to the schools to get their packets? So we will be rolling that out next week in a staggered way so that if they're online, we don't have to have them come on site anywhere. If they need a packet, then we assign them a time. If they're in a highly isolated, hard to get to area, they're, you know, they're traveling an hour or more, and we do have students like that, then we're figuring out how do we do drop off for those students. Okay, so that letter is yet to come from the department to all students next week, I guess? It won't be from necessarily generic from the department. It'll be by school uh, right. because they'll be, they'll be monitoring their, their group of students. Right. Okay, so yeah. they'll, but will all of them have to go to school to pick up something or will they be sent Only a letter? some of them who don't have internet access. The packets, the right. others will be mailed a letter that gives instructions? The other, uh, if we have a number, a, a large number of students who are on internet, so we just send them a link, they'll get um, on, right? Okay. And they're connected mm -hmm. with their teacher, <laughs> right? <laughs> and as adults, we all keep <laughs> learning from the kids. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent. Um, as we're talking, I'm getting people asking me questions via text and says, um, will the extension of the school closure until April 30th apply to teachers as well or are they expected to come in to do virtual learning? Many of them are wondering whether they will have to come in, it's very confusing. Well, as I've said, it, it is hard to go to and, and wait for one notification. We've asked teachers to keep checking in with their principals. All teachers are working this week and they'll continue to work virtually. Uh, they're not being asked to come into school sites. A few teachers have asked if they can come back into the building to pick up materials or pick up, and so we're giving them staggered times to come back in if they wanna come pick up materials. Uh, so we wanna support the teachers. Um, teachers who don't have access to internet themselves, uh, we're, we're making modifications, again, by school site via the principal. So each principal has their own planning cycle. In fact, yesterday and today, teachers just got back from spring break yesterday. Yesterday and today, they've been meeting with their principals okay, uh, so and they're doing planning this week. Okay, so to clarify, the April 30th closure, um, it depends upon each school and each school principal as to how the teachers are they will each have their own school-based instructional design plan and how they're interacting with students based on their student population. But through April 30th, students are not coming to the right. school site and teachers are not coming to the school site either unless they need access to 
picking up their laptop or picking up materials. Okay. So teachers are not required to go into the schools. They're closed until April 30th as well. They're closed until April okay. 30th as well, but they are teleworking. So they're okay. all working. Um, the only exception that I want to clarify is right now we're still having conversations about those students, again, the medically fragile, right. those who with severe needs where we don't want to send them into hospital settings and what can we do and should we use school sites for those select students. Okay. I think that helps because people watching are texting us. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, so the buildings are all closed, so that's a, the general message. Yes. On the whole site. Yes. So how are the students going to um, graduate? So each, each year, at the end of the year, so that you know you can go to the next grade, what are you doing? Is it all going to be in that distance learning mode? Or yes, otherwise. so that's a challenge. Uh, right now we have um, up through third qu quarter grades, right? So third quarter grades still need to be posted and we're working on the posting of third quarter grades. And then after third quarter, we're, we're losing instructional time. And for our uh, graduating seniors, um, there are two things happening. By the end of the day, Friday, we have high schools that are planning through uh, with the administration what the gradu modified graduation requirements will be. I will be issued mo issuing modified graduation requirements and taking that to the Board of Education. I'll be having a, a com an initial conversation with them on April 2nd, which is the uh, next uh, teleboard meeting. It'll be our first teleboard meeting. Mm -hmm. And we'll be, I'll be proposing to them modifications uh, for students to graduate. The, and so we'll have uh, levels of requirements uh, for students if they were on track, if they had been falling behind already, if they were already at risk of not graduating, what they need to do, how we're going to support them. So that's the planning we're doing this week for high school seniors and we'll be rolling out to that, rolling out a response to families, uh, uh, completing our work at the end of the day Friday. So they will have enough instruction to be able to graduate um, for those who are on track. They, they will have a modified requirements to the policy that I'll ask the board to do an exception for this year. Okay. Otherwise, we don't have enough time to, to make up all those lost days. So you can't keep them into the summer. You can't go longer. You have to stay within the... Well, just graduating seniors, we're talking about 10,000 students. Right? Mm. So um, if we were to keep uh, the school system um, uh, uh, open uh, for each additional month for asking, we would be coming back to the legislature for upward of $5 million a month uh, for those to, to bring back uh, teachers and supports uh, during non, what would typically be non-instructional school year uh, in the summer. So we're, we're trying to balance all of that and allow kids to to go on to the colleges. Many of them have been accepted already mm -hmm. and working with the colleges around what a graduation diploma is gonna look like this year. So that would be my concern, the seniors who are going on to college, that they actually have the credit or they have instruction. Whether you, what instruction is online covers that whole, whole um, curriculum so that they can do it, uh, you know, asynchronously but still complete it so that they do they can compete with wherever they're going to college especially the college kids yes and they'll have different pathways to get to those requirements but even the overall requirements will need to be uh, modified and that's what we're prepping uh, this week so that we can do that announcement Yes. We want our 10,000 <laughs> students moving on. Yeah. It's not just the kids going to college, uh, the kids going to work and we're getting certificates, mm -hmm. uh, professional certif certifications. Also our students that were uh, needed to meet eligibility for the military, we're working with the military around what that looks like because there are a series of tests, entry tests as well, placement tests for the military um, that, that the military hasn't been able to complete and that will potentially delay students um, mm -hmm. uh, getting in um, through the summer. So what happens to them if they delay through the summer, even through the fall, before they go into the military, what happens to those young people? So you are articulating with those different pathways. Yes, That's yes. Good. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, information, Superintendent. I think um, it was important for us to know um, that our seniors this year are going to be on track, and even if 
they do not go back to school at all this year, that those that were on the pathway to graduation can complete their graduation, particularly those who are going on to college or the military or need their CTE certification. Right. Um, so, so I guess the question is that many may, ne may not have an actual graduation um, commencement exercise as, as they are used to, but um, everything is being done to make sure that they are on track to graduate on time with their um, certification, whatever else they need, for, whether it's for military, entering military or their CTE. But I also wanted you to explain um, what the changes or the, uh, that USDOE has allowed you guys to do with um, assessment tests, et cetera, to not um, have to go through that exercise this year, is that correct? So last Friday, the USDOE called the meeting uh, with all the state superintendents um, and um, uh, allowed within a few hours time a simplified um, application. We were glad it was simplified application to, to turn something around to them the same day asking for uh, a, a modification and exemption to state testing. Uh, we submitted one uh, uh, and uh, within a few hours time, they responded and approved it. And so um, I will be taking that to the Board of Ed again at our next meeting so that, because uh, typically it would go through a board process and, and there's nothing typical happening these days as we know. Uh, but at the same time, just keeping the Board of Ed informed and going through those processes around what policy exemptions we need the board to certify as approved for this year. Uh, but we do have the exemption from the USDOE um, within hours on the same day they responded. That's probably the first time ever we've gotten a same day response. <laughs> that was response. gonna be my, my next comments, probably. Uh, so we appreciate that. We appreciate that everyone's trying to work really hard to be responsive. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, Betsy DeVos took it upon herself to make sure that that happened because um, for um, for us and for you know all the schools on the mainland too, they have the same issue you know mm -hmm. dealing with their their graduates. Um, I also had a concern about our um, our high school uh, seniors in particular, but I know that many high school students at, at all levels um, do um, you know pathways and are taking college curriculum already knowing um, that we had the uh, University of Hawaii in right before you, you came in, um, and they also are, you know, of course, having issues. They have disbanded classes, and they are doing all <laughs> online. I am not sure that uh, most of the placement, the, the um, advanced uh, pathways and uh, classes that we have at the high school level um, are able to, to do the online curriculum, and also for the CTE programs. <laughs> whether or not, they, they have disbanded those at community colleges too, so I don't know if that's impacting um, our high school students also. Can you address that? So yes, there certainly will be an impact there. Uh, and that's, again, that's part of the planning we're in the middle of, of looking at the various impacts of what's happening. Uh, we are working with the colleges uh, very closely with uh, President Lausner's team around what this means. Kids that are in a um, early college uh, credit bearing course uh, that doesn't have an easy translation onto an online course, those are the ones that are, are gonna be non-completers and how do we make up that time and that content so students can can get that credit at some point and, and finish up the work, mm -hmm. right? So that still needs to be worked out. With kids that are in uh, courses that have a online version, then, then those are gonna be the easier ones that they can stay um, on course and complete their work. So we're gonna have kids all over the place, which is why we're having school-based, teacher-based plans mm -hmm for what each group of kids need uh, to be successful in, in graduating. And that's our priority, right? It's our highest need students and our students that are graduating and make sure that we're meeting those needs. Uh, we'll, we'll need to plan those. We will have certainly students that will need to make up instructional time over the summer. And so there'll, there'll be some extended um, learning period that's needed to finish off 
uh, 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 requirements. Uh, what we still don't know uh, to the full extent is how much of that work and that extended time is going to require additional resources, right? Because now you're having staff continue for longer time, make modifications and so forth. And so uh, not sure what that's going to cost us yet. Uh, and so uh, each step of the way we're looking at, again, being very careful about um, how we're spending monies now, stopping everything other than what is necessary to keep the work going, knowing that there may be these extended year costs. Uh, the other piece of conversation really is with the lost instructional days, which are quite significant. Uh, I was hoping, that's why we did the April 7th initially, is can we reopen on April 7th and not have to make up any instru instructional time if we stay closed beyond April 7th, it was a clear line in the sand that said we would need to make up instructional time after that. So again, it's, it's just being planful uh, with the team. Now we know that we're going to stay close through April 30th, which means we're going to have to figure out what that additional instructional time means um, and where we can provide waivers to what's a typical year and, and, um, and move on to next year, provide additional supports next year uh, rather than trying to um, move it into the summer. We probably don't have enough days in the summer plus the summer transition and the transition into a new school year uh, with the number of days that we're, we're missing now. I'm sure our task force chair, De La Cruz, who also chairs of our Ways and Means Committee, is very happy to hear you uh, be concerned about the <laughs> DOE's budget. Um, that being said, I think a lot of us are also concerned about um, our economic stability once we have passed this pandemic. And um, to be honest, not just looking at our um, our graduates who are going on to college or into the military, et cetera, for those who are studying to get their um, CTEs, um, I think probably concerns us because they were part of the group that, that were looking to go right into jobs immediately after graduation with their certificates. Right. Um, because that may not happen, I, I would ask that you consider when you're working on this issue with um, the teachers and also the uh, university level instructors, that also maybe you consider working with uh, the unions, whether it's the carpenters or auto bodies, et cetera, that maybe some kind of uh, letter, you know, that the students could have that they were on track to get their certificate until this happened, and that uh, you are, if you have not figured it out by, by then, I don't mean you personally, but mm -hmm. the system, that um, there are still plans for them to come back and finish their certification, but they, you know, up to that point was qualified. And that may be helpful in um, helping these students get the job that they were looking for, at least the employers know that, that they were online, and uh, maybe on the job training could also help. So if you would consider that, I'd be very yes. grateful. I'm sure they would too. Senators, further questions? Thank you. Senator Dela Cruz. Yeah, I just had a quick question. What are the new sanitation policies that the department is putting into place um, as they go about serving all these meals? So uh, we have uh, protocols for, um, for cleaning and sanitizing spaces, prepping uh, meal, sp meal spaces. Um, and so uh, I can share those. I, I wouldn't know those offhand. Uh, but we are um, uh, taking action. For example, uh, there is a statewide order we have um, jump on, jumped onto around masks and gloves and making sure we don't run out of those things. Uh, there is a cleaning of spaces before they're used, and there's a cleaning of spaces um, after they're utilized. Um, there's a protocol for when meals are picked up, where they can be picked up, spacing between kids, who gets to touch the meal, who can't touch the meal, and so forth. Uh, so we have protocols across the board on, um, on meal locations for preparation. 
kids and, and anyone from the community is not entering meal preparation spaces at all. Meal distributions are happening outside um, and the preparation spaces are only for, the, uh, for those who are preparing meals um, through those uh, protocols that are defined. Okay, so is someone monitoring that that actually occurs at each other different sites? So we have a lot of checks and balances. We have uh, Randy Tanaka, assistant superintendent, and his team uh, checking in on sites. We have principals checking in on sites. In fact, uh, we've only done the, this, this new meal services uh, these last two days, yesterday and today. And so principals are on site or they have an administrator on site. So there's lots of check-ins around these protocols. In fact, I, I was on site uh, today just checking in. Uh, I couldn't enter the meal preparation area either, even as superintendent, right? So I stayed outside uh, and, and followed all the protocols myself um, as I observed what was happening. I asked the, the food preparation folks, um, uh, the food preparers um, uh, uh, questions about how things are going, whether they had what they needed. So there's lots of check-ins with our staff and we'll continue to do so. Okay, thanks. If you guys can just take a look at the Star Advertiser, there was an article and then there was a photo that talked about all the different food being distributed. Okay. In the photo, in the photo, the, um, <laughs> the food preparers don't have any gloves. Yeah, I'll check on that. That sounds very unusual. So I'm hoping that was a staged photo and not a photo photo of an actual site. But I will, I will check on that. We take that very seriously and we have uh, lots of reminders that go out to staff and lots of check-ins. So um, that's, that's something that is, some, uh, that, that's a protocol that's very important to us. But also, uh, we, like I said, we have lots of folks checking in on, um, on the procedures being used. But we'll check up on, on that specific situation. Okay, but I really do appreciate um, the amount of work you guys are putting into making sure that our Kiki still has food in this time. So thank you very much. Mahalo, Senator. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any you. more questions? You have your work cut out for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I think there was question. one other question. Oh, the Senator Keohokololi. Uh, hi, thank you, Superintendent, for presenting today. I might have missed it if you um, covered this earlier, but can you talk, you know, I realize that there are a whole lot of uh, higher priorities that you're trying to get organized at the moment. I'm wondering whether uh, on the repair and maintenance side, on the capital improvement side, whether those projects have just been put on hold? Have they been, are there certain uh, types of projects that are being deemed essential? How are you folks proceeding with all of that? So we, we do have a schedule of projects that we are following. The, uh, the need for uh, distancing and those safety measures are adding time uh, and we are seeking an extension of anything that is, um, that ha any, any funds that are uh, uh, expiring at the end of this um, uh, fiscal year uh, to, so that we add in uh, space for that additional time, but we do have uh, projects that are continuing. We're just putting in place the safety measures on um, access, uh, social distancing, um, ensuring that uh, things are cleaned up before and after work and so forth. Thank you. Do you have some sort of prioritization matrix that, that you're working with or, or putting together to determine what projects uh, need to continue throughout this shutdown and what projects probably are going to be delayed because of the nature of the situation? Uh, we do, and we can certainly share that. Great, thank you. Okay. Any further questions? If not, Superintendent, thank you so much thank for you. joining us today. Good luck. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you for all you're doing. Aloha and patience all around. Yeah. Appreciate everyone's support. Thank you.
energy. Thank you for joining the Senate uh, Committee on COVID-19. We are here for our three o'clock um, discussion with Hawaii Tourism Authority Director Chris Tatum, who is on the line with us. Welcome, Chris. Two o'clock. Hi, Chris. Two. I'm sorry, two o'clock. Aloha. 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 Thank you for joining us. Can you give us um, an update of what uh, HTA is uh, doing in the recent uh, <laughs> the recent few days. Absolutely, and, and, I, and I apologize. I apologize for sending you so much data, but we want to continue to put out as much information as we can, and um, and also want to make sure that if there's any additional data that you are you, you're interested in, we can put put together and cut it any way you want. Um, the debt, we've, we've been spending the last, obviously, uh, probably a week and a half, number one, informing the industry uh, and, and the world what's going on in Hawaii and our status with the coronavirus. Um, we knew, obviously, a while ago that the, with, the, with, the, with the coronavirus, the impact on business was already starting to, to decrease significantly. We, you know, it's been important that we're engaged with the industry, and so all the all the communications that I shared a fair amount of communications that I've been sending out. But we created the um, that, that daily briefer, that, that, that couple page document that we sent you with some information on on the, the data and kind of what information we're getting from the industry, so everyone's aware of what was going on. The the numbers have obviously up dramatically, you know, in, in, on a normal, we would, we, normal day in Hawaii, depending on time of the year, we would be having 36 to 50,000 arrivals a day. As of, uh, as of, uh, I think it was the 16th, we were at, we had already gotten down to 20,000 arrivals. And as of uh, the 22nd, a couple days ago, we were down to 7,000 arrivals. And that also includes um, uh, residents returning. So if we took a kind of a ratio, because we don't really know exactly all the time on a day-to-day -day standpoint on which the residents are or visitors, but on a day-to-day -day standpoint, we do about 4,000 residents arriving a day. So you would, we're looking at probably down to 3,000 visitors who are arriving on the 22nd. I will tell you, um, in the discussion, we've been spending all of our time with the industry, and they've been doing a phenomenal job informing the, the visitors that they need to to actually go home. And, and and I think they've done it in a very professional manner. You know, our our ability to do it correctly and and uh, with Aloha will always impact us for the future, which is always in the back of our mind. We have such an obligation to provide the revenue to support the state of Hawaii. It's, it's, uh, I know it how, how, how much we respect you guys, but it's just tearing our heart out to, to push these folks out. It's just so contrary to what we've done all our lives. But anyway, they, uh, so for the most part, the last number I got is I've got about 26 hotels that are closed across the state. And I can, uh, if you're interested, I can give you, we'll try to keep up with them. They're, they're, they're very good at kind of reaching out to us. Um, some, uh, some, of them are, some of them are staying open for a number of reasons. Um, the bigger hotel companies are consolidating the, 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 the people that are there. there. You have people there that have medical uh, issues. You got people that are here on work for one reason or the other. And we're also expecting probably you know, it, we'll, emergency and responders. Um, we'll we'll see how that goes. But the hotels have been very flexible on that. They've also stepped up and offered uh, accommodations to Aima for uh, whether it be for 
quarantine or emergency support. And they, IUNA has all the contract numbers who have, who have stepped up and pretty much all of them have, uh, depending on their situation and where they're located and their, and their, their staffing, want to help. Um, whether it be for you know, whatever facility they want to use. We also um, did a tour with IUNA yesterday at the convention center. Uh, so they, they're, they're taking a look at the options they want to use the convention center for, for uh, depending on how the, the process of emergency um, and, and the crisis goes. Um, the only, you know, the, the convention center is pretty much, it's, it's dark now. The only people that are here are, are us. We've, uh, we've shut down all the utilities throughout the building except for where our office is. And um, we are going to, we are working with the rental car company, the company, they're still trying to find places to park all their cars. So we're going to, we're going to make a deal with them to try to recoup some money. We've got 600 parking spots here. So we're going to, we're going to rent about five of hundred of them. We want to hold the other ones for the emergency in case. And we've also informed the rental car company that we want to help them, we to help them but we're within the, the agreement to also have a 24 hour notice that we need to serve them out for one reason or another. Um, with the, where we are right now, it's important for us to maintain those relationships. We, you know, just before I go on to that, the, 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 the importance of, I will tell you that every one of the hoteliers and the industry people are really, like you are, concerned about their employees and, um, they understand the situation. A lot of them are very experienced, whether it be with 9/11, SARS, H1N1. And, but you know, they're really no. This is so. No one has this kind of experience on how long this will last, and they're very, very worried about their employees and, and especially the health benefits. And I had some conversations with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the governor's office, and also even Eric Gill, and and we want to work together to try to figure out, you know, how we can, how we can support them in the future. Most of, all of them, for the most part, said they're, they're, they'll carry them for at least 30 days, maybe even up to 90 days. They all want to do what's right for the, 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 uh, the employees, and they're so, they're so concerned about that. So we'll, we'll work together with them and, and also with, uh, with, the, with the administration to see what we can do. And I, know that, I don't know the details. You guys probably know better than I do what kind of how the funding comes from the federal government and so those bills get passed, but our hope is that, you know, that the, those, are, those are focused on the employees and, you know, and, and hopefully keeping the, the small businesses that may not come out of this unless they get support. Um, that's, that's the major concern. Um, we're, we're, it's a really important on the relationship that we did this the right way, you know, and, and all the feedback I've got from the hotel and the discussions I've had directly with, with uh, visitors have been, you know, they understand, they clearly understand what's going on and they appreciate, our focus has been telling them that, um, you know, we need them to go because we have limited resources here from, from a medical standpoint. We look forward to them coming back someday in the future when this is over. And every one of them, they understand it, they get it. Um, uh, the relationship we have with our partners especially the airlines is going to be vital. The, um, the numbers of the, uh, the flights that have canceled have gone down. Uh, it, 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 every day we're getting more information on how many flights are canceling. Um, do we have a question? 1,336. Yeah. So we'll get to the information, but you know, you know the the Qantas flight canceled today. That star canceled today. They they were trying to get all their people out this week. Um, Japan Airlines is planning on canceling on the 28th. All all their flights and A and A. So, but that relationship's going to be really important. They know they all want to come back, and that's what we want to you know we want to make sure that everyone knows that how badly we want them back when the time is right. And they're all very supportive of that. And they, the, the communication has been thought fabulous from them. We really appreciate that. I don't have an update yet on um, on, on Southwest. They're supposed to give us an update this afternoon on what their final plans are. Um, but you know that 
that idea, you know, they, they range a little bit on how, how long they think they're going to be shut down. Um, some of them have only till middle of April. Some have uh, end of end of April. They they'll probably just you know they'll look at each, every, when it comes up to those times to make a decision. The hotels are ranging from 30 days to 60 days on how 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 much how long they're planning to be closed. So. Again, they'll be flex they're going to be flexible on it, but I just want to share with you kind of what I what I know of from my my interactions with the, with the with the industry, and then our our relationship and 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 with the the wholesalers, the tour operators, the BMCs, it's, it's going to be vital to our future because you know at the end when this is all over, uh, God willing, we'll um, uh, everyone's going to want the business, but we want to do it the right way and. Everyone loves Hawaii, as everyone knows here. They uh, they really care about Hawaii as much as anyone, and, and they really this is this is the destination. So we think those relationships are still strong, and we just need to coordinate because at the end of the day, without those planes flying, we don't get any business. So working with them as we move forward is going to be vital. From a from a process standpoint, I just want to share with you. I sent you a letter that I sent to the board of all the things that we've been doing. But we've, you know, we've I've been I've had meetings with the with the general managers of the hotels and the airlines. Uh, first, on the our, our our reaction and response to the coronavirus, make sure we're all aligned with the Department of Health. And then I I had this preliminary meeting with uh, the airlines, the wholesalers, and the hotels, and uh, just to talk about. Not that we're ready to do any marketing, obviously we're not until the time is right, but just to have that in mind that we want to do it as a team, as a destination, because our resources between HCA and the, and, and the, uh, the industry can be significant if we do it right and we're aligned as, as we come out of this in the future. So that, that's, uh, sorry for talking so much, but I just, it's, um, to be honest with you, it's a little emotional. Uh, mainly because I had a chance to spend some time with my staff at the Marriott, um, who I worked with for 15 years, and them being out of work. Uh, but they, they really, you know, they're great people. We've had great people, and they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna get through it. They just, you know, we, we just need to give them the pressure support as we can. So thank, thanks for giving me a chance to, to open it that way. Thank you, Chris, for that update. Um, Truly appreciate you joining us today. Um, we do have some of our senators online um, with us also, Senator Chair De La Cruz, uh, Senator Favela, and Senator Keoho Kolole, as well as myself here in conference room, and, and uh, Senator Kim and Senator Moriwaki. Um, can I start off by asking you whether or not the um, Hotels will be considering assisting their employees with filing unemployment claims. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you might have broken up. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. <laughs> Do you know if any of the hotels will help and assist their employees with uh, filing the unemployment uh, papers? Yeah. So you know they got uh, you know obviously the the the, uh, the uh, organization. Uh, got hit pretty hard with unemployment claims. So we've, we've met with, uh, and I had multiple calls from the human resource director, met with, uh, uh, had, had multiple conversations with Scott um, over at the, the labor department. So we, th they're working through it. We've offered, and, and uh, whatever it takes, uh, the last conversation we had was if we need to, we will take the, um, um, the forms to the, to the hotels ourselves give them to the human resource director and they will actually help them fill out the form. Um, and then we, we, we could bring it back to the, the labor department if we need to. It sounds like a lot of the things that Scott and the team are doing seem to be improving things and, and talking to a couple of human resources managers today, but you know, I, I, this is obviously for the long haul, but we'll do whatever we can to support them. And, and if we need to be going from hotel to hotel, I know the Human resource directors are fine. They'll do whatever it takes. If they're sitting in the offices, 
with these uh, employees trying to get them online uh, to get their unemployment. So um, it, it's a work in process. Thank you. I wanted to let you know that um, some of the feedback that I have been getting from constituents and friends was that um, I think it's important that the, the airlines and even the hotels um, continue offering um, discount rates to, to residents or frequent travelers, but to make sure that the effective date is after our pandemic issue is over rather than at this time. So I think that was important for um, you to hear and that the community, they appreciate and you know, wanna make sure that we can help um, our economic uh, investment in, in Hawaii uh, with all of our hotels and our tourism industry, but this was not the time to be um, asking people to come and visit us anyway. Um, with that said. No, that absolutely. I don't, I don't know if you had a chance to see the, the, um, the, uh, the latest thing we sent out ahead of time. Thank you. Senator Kim has a question. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for all that, all that you're doing. Um, you know, we really depend on our industry and our workers, and so it's so important. Uh, I know that they have been talked about utilizing our uh, industry workers in other areas where we're short of manpower. So I'm not sure if that information is funneling through to the workers. I know there's other areas like I've seen supermarkets saying they need workers, they need help because you know they're overwhelmed um, now that you know they're the main source of anybody getting getting nutrition and food. So are you folks helping in any way to help funnel some of our, our employees that are not working? Working to into some of these temporary jobs. Yeah, Senator, I think it's a, that's a great point. We um, initially we had um, information that um, uh, first of all, at, at the time we thought we'd be able to help and and, and, and fill the jobs with the census. Unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen. And then there were some some other opportunities that we've been putting forward to 
the industry, but I think you're spot on. I think that's a, you know, those are the types of things we can't, we should be spending more time on now that we've, for the most part, gotten the visitors out. I think our focus should be on the employees, and I, and I, and we will take that on and be more aggressive in that space. Thank you, because I know when we met with General Hara and we talked about um, screenings and things at the airport and, and so forth that you yeah. know they could use, um, utilize the uh, hotel workers or industry, visitor industry workers. And again, you know, places like um, the supermarkets and other businesses that are remaining open uh, find that they have shortage and they were short before before this all started because yeah. of the low unemployment. So certainly they're looking, so I think we need to put the two together and because uh, they'll make more than they will being on the unemployment, on unemployment. Um, so, you know, that certainly would be helpful. The other question I had is, yeah. how are you folks, uh, you helping with um, ensuring that the visitors that are, are arriving or have arrived are gonna be um, adhering to the 14 day quarantine? So, so what's happening is, so on, on Thursday when they start when they start coming in, well, who's ever does come in, they'll they'll uh, there's a checkpoint that they'll have at the, at the airport. They're gonna they're using the forms, the agriculture forms. There isn't there is information on the hotel, but they'll have to they'll have to do those forms the back and put that information. The folks at the at the airport and this is DOT, I believe. They're gonna they're gonna record that information. And then also take, do their ID. They're gonna they're gonna get their ID to make sure it matches up. And then we're gonna we're gonna our plan is to scan it. That's correct. So can you walk one? Yeah. That, so you know our plan at this point in time is to work with DOT. Who's airport, speaking? Um, to get the ad forms once they, as Chris mentioned, once they've been confirmed, um, once they pass, you know, through their uh, thermal scans, you know, collect those ad forms. Uh, do the high-speed scanning, collect the data, put it into a database, um, and then use that information to call forward to um, the hotel the, the, where the pa uh, passengers, the visitors will be um, going to. So just to basically give um, advance notice to the hotel that these passengers who are supposed to be in that 14-day quarantine are currently on their way to the hotel um, so that the hotel can take the appropriate steps to ensure that those, pass, uh, those visitors are in fact in quarantine 14 days. Can that speaker, the hotel, excuse me, can the speaker the identify himself? Some information so that those people, as they come in, and then they're, you know, they'll, they'll have to work, if they're, they have a problem, I mean, I was, in my, in my history within the hotel, we, we do run into people that are sick for one reason or another, that may need, that are self-quarantined, I haven't had an issue in the past um, on, on all the, the, the situations I've had in the past. However, if it became an issue, the hotels know that they need to tell, they'll, they'll call um, in, in Honolulu HPD or, or one of the other, uh, on the other island, same thing. Chris, can you identify the speaker who spoke in, before you? Uh, I, I apologize, sir, I didn't hear that. Who, who was the speaker just before you that answered the question? Uh, uh, that was uh, Keith Regan, the Chief Administrative Officer for HDA. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so just to follow up, you Thank said you. that you would, these forms are gonna be filled out and you're going to be doing the database. How long is all of this gonna take, this information to get put together and then the information, a matter of an hour or so, if you're gonna get it before they reach their hotel destination? So the, so the information, I mean, how long does it take to get the information to the hotel? Yeah, you're gonna have to scan the data. You said you're gonna have to get the form. Somebody's gonna have to go through it. Um, you know, so how long is that? And do they have the manpower? Is there, does the airlines or the airport have the manpower? Yeah, so uh, Senator, thank you for the question. So from what we understand, because um, DOT Airport is the one handling the actual, um, you know, uh, offboarding process. But once we get our hands on the form, you know, we're, we're trying to coordinate with DOT Airport to get us some space um, at the airport facility so that we can actually do the scanning 
um, and data entry right then and there um, at the airport. So as the plane, you know, from, from our standpoint, as the plane lands and they offboard and they go through that process, those forms are then collected and then we're going to get those forms from the aircraft, run them through the high-speed scanners, um, input that through the high-speed scanners, they have OCR so they can read all the um, you know, written information that's on those forms and that we put into a database. Um, and then that database, which is going to be, uh, which will have cloud access, um, will be accessed by a team of, of individuals we have uh, that will be will making phone calls to those uh, hotels that are, are in that process. So, um, you know, as soon as we get those forms from, from DOA, because DOA still needs to do their portion, um, we're going to input them and, and get that in a straight one. But, you know, it's currently the way that the process is set up, in a typical non-COVID, you know, um, fashion, you know, we would go and pick up those forms on a daily basis, take them back to um, right. the processing center, and then and then process them. But we're actually gonna, we actually want to have a scanning site right there at the airport, uh, so there is not that delay in terms of getting that information into the database. We want to try to get it into that database as quickly as possible because we need to get that information to the hotel ASAP. So from our standpoint. From ACA's standpoint, we're ready to go. We're ready to support this mission, um, be a part of it, and um, you know, as soon as we're ready to start that quarantine process, we'll be right there with the DOT. And, and going back to your your comments that we'll be using uh, industry employees to do that. Um, as you know, there's plenty available, and we'll, 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 we're 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 going to work with the with the hotels and even in the in other other areas. The staff, we've been working with. Uh, with, with John, um, John, John Monahan and their team, and then we'll, we'll, we'll staff it. We'll take care of that. The, 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 other, the other one I just want to share with you is that you mentioned a good point on how we can utilize our, um, our industry staff that's out of work. We were working with DOT, and we, we reached out to DOT, I mean D DOH, and uh, they're, they're, we're assuming, I'm not an expert, but we're assuming that the, the workload on investigating and calling around and finding out where all these these people who have been confirmed with, with coronavirus, where they've been and who they've talked to and what, you know, what activities or anything they've done, their investigation has got to be a, kind of, it's got to be an overload. And so we've offered to, again, coordinate, bring in the industry people then, maybe even have a little, having a, um, uh, well, headquarters here at the convention center, if they want to, to support the Department of Health, to make those calls and based on what the direction they give. So we'll, whatever they need, we'll, we'll, put, we'll put it together. Thank you. And finally, what about people who are wanting to leave? I've gotten calls um, from people, visitors here, saying, you know, I came here to visit and I'm going to want to go back. What's going to happen? Are they going to be allowed to leave? And are they going to, or are they required to be 14 days um, quarantined? Or are they going to be tested before they leave? I mean, that's not clear. And of course, if the flights are being canceled, I'm not sure how they'll leave. But can, is that something that you have information about? I think, uh, it, just if I can restate that, Senator, sorry, um, we're, we're trying to understand. The question was basically, um, if you have a visitor who wants to leave, they're in a quarantine, they're in that quarantine period, but they want to leave prior to the quarantine period, was that the question, Senator? Well, well that's probably another question, but no, people who are here now uh, that came before and is supposed to leave like, you know, next week or want to leave either early or go back when they're supposed to go back. Um, how are they going, are they going to be allowed to go back and are they going to be screened or tested? I'm not sure, they're not sure what to expect. Um, so is there any guidance for them? So you're talking about the people that are here now? Yes. Oh, okay. So actually, We've been spending a fair amount of time on that piece because the concern we had, to be honest with you, is that that the, when we when we when we first did the quarantine, that the that the, that the airlines would cancel too quickly because we need to get them get all these people home. So we're spending a fair amount of time, and the hotels have really stepped up on trying to help these guys get out of here. Uh, the idea was to get them out before tomorrow. Um, 
and, and for a number of reasons. I mean, since they're here, they're already in a, a stay-at-home mode. Even though they're not strictly in quarantine, they're in stay-at-home. They're not allowed to leave the hotel. So, so based on the, uh, the directives that we've given. So no, you know, nobody, unless they've got some kind of medical reason that they were here for some other reason, nobody wants to be here for vacation right now. It's not pleasant even though we love our state. So we, they've been spending a lot of time between the airlines, the hotels, uh, HBCB, us, and a lot of the travel agents, we've been, we've been trying to get them out by tomorrow if we can. There may be some that, that for some, one reason or other that they didn't get out. Even when we, when the Qantas said they were gonna cancel, we got a little, little, little concerned, but, but they, uh, they, were, they were pretty adamant that they were going to get their residents home one way or the other if it became an issue. Okay, well, I did advise the people calling me uh, that they should try to leave before the governor's um, edict goes in. And yeah. so and that they yeah. might not be able to get flights out when they want to get flights out as well. Um, so I think that you know needs to be made um, more publicly, so um, people aren't stranded at, at this point. So, um, or otherwise they just have to stay. <laughs> so, anyway, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. A question from uh, Senator Mori Walker. Thank you, um, Chris. Hi, hi, Chris. Uh, thank you. You mentioned about the hotels or what hotels are open, and there's been some discussion also of coordinating um, rooms that might be available for f um, first um, for um, uh, medical staff as well as maybe even the homeless. But you know, different l uses of hotel rooms so that uh, under both the orders of the the uh, the mayor and the governor. These are essential workers, and therefore, you know, could clean the rooms. Could you could keep them still on staff? Have you folks talked about who might be essential workers and what hotels are open and coordinating that? So when the time comes, uh, I know we just had uh, President Lasner here, and he had talked with you about uh, using it as as. Um, uh, dorms for the students if they needed it. Um, has there been any discussion on what rooms might be available, which hotels would be open, and how that might be coordinated so that um, we could use it for the various um, residential needs that we might have in this um, in this period? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, the, 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 the response from the, the hotels is very, very positive. They want to do whatever it takes to get us through the this, this situation. Everything from, um, you mentioned uh, David Lasser, we had, had conversations over the weekend about uh, kids that were probably coming back to campus or that couldn't really, that they're going to go into quarantine. And the hotel stepped up, but the outrigger guys stepped up. We said, listen, we'll, we'll work with UH and see what we can do to make sure we get these kids so they're not putting all together. Um, they, we've given, uh, in general, like I'll give you examples of Marriott hotels, my old company, they're going to keep one hotel operational on each island for, for a number of reasons, just from a flexibility. And, and they, you know, they still have all these properties. We pay their clothes, but a majority of them will still have security on staff. They'll have human resources there helping their employees get through this process. Um, they'll have engineers maintaining the, the infrastructure behind the scenes. So there, there's still going to be people there. And, and you know, they're, they're still looking and, and dealing with the groups that they're going to have to move in. So you have salespeople working to try to move the groups and hopefully book them in the future sometime. So they'll still have people around on those products. Most of the big hotels have consolidated. Um, I believe in, in Waikiki, for example, I didn't share in Waikiki, they're using for all the Marriott uh, and moving whatever few rooms there are. So I think there will be inventory available um, on the island. And, and very candidly, if we run into a problem, I would, I would uh, uh, work with Taima. I would get the hotel they need. In, in that regard, talking, you had mentioned small businesses and the hotels needing support. 
um, so that they can stabilize during this period, whether it's 30 days or 90 days or beyond. Um, what kinds of things should we be looking at in terms of helping um, the hotels uh, and the workers uh, so that we can, in fact, stabilize and be ready for the recovery. But at this point, um, like you say, working with the employees, getting them into other, other kinds of positions where we might need help, but also um, the, the hotels and what they might need. With the cash flow or whatever they need to, to stabilize. Yeah, I, I, I talked to uh, the administration. We've had conversations with Carl. Um, I, I don't, you know, my, I wanted I wanted to share with them the 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 issues in front of us and the challenges relative to the employees, especially when it comes to maintaining their health care in the future. You know, originally we we're you know we were thinking about well, listen, we've got a million more people in Hawaii. How do we util you know util um, take advantage of and try to get them, even even trying to bring them back into Waikiki, but in the current situation, it doesn't work because um, they're not supposed to leave their home. So we're, we're kind of at a standstill from what we can do right now as far as their business, but I think, I think working together with, 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 with you guys and the administration and the industry um, as, we, as we come out of this, short term, we just got to try to keep their benefits. And I know they, they'll all be applying for unemployment, and I get that, but the, the, you know, knowing that some, depending on what, what companies they are, the variance on their ability to maintain those benefits over the, over the, over the long haul, it, it, it really concerns me. And, and so I, I shared that with, with the governor, and everyone knows it's a priority. Again, I don't understand the, how that, that money that can come from the federal government would trickle down. Hopefully, that would be our focus, and, and including the small businesses that, you know, we just want them to come back and we want them to work again. My assumption is that most of these big hotels will come back. I mean, they, they're they going to take a huge hit, but they, they still, you know, they have enough capital behind them to, to come back. So the owners of the hotels, um, you know, that's going to be, you know, I think it's a property by property, um, what, how, how they're going to how they're going to get through that, depending on how bad, how much they're leveraged. So that's the, you know, I, no one's called me on that piece yet. I know that I, I feel more for these small independent uh, uh, tour companies that are going to be struggling on cash flow. So I, I think those are the things we hopefully we can focus on whatever money comes from the Fed. You know, you gave us data on the um, vacation rental performance. Um, are you? Do you get data from the short-term rentals? That um, th that was one area where you know it was hard to regulate and hard to know who's still there uh, from out of state. Uh, uh, is there? How do you get that data, or do you have that data? The, the, the data that we get for, uh, uh, I've got Jennifer Chun here. The data on the rentals, obviously, we get them all from the, the company that does it on, on they pull it off the web, right? Right. We have uh, a contractor. Uh, we have a contractor, and they provide us monthly reports. Um, so we won't get the next report for, so it's not really real time information. Uh, we won't know until this, pretty much the end of next month what would open this month. So that's, uh, that's the nature of the contract. And, so that's just aggregate data. You don't have whether these are people who are just coming in or uh, or not, or um, whether they're long term or longer term. They've been here for 14 days or more. They don't get it till a month later. So uh, honestly, um, agricultural forum they do ask where the lodging is, and they're asking for the address. Mm. So in theory, if you're staying at a vacation rental, you should be putting the address of the vacation. So we'll get it somehow. Uh, so that will be part of the information that uh, DOT Airport will collect, and then we'll, that'll get scanned. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you, you guys, and, and, and I, know, I know you all are think, <coughs> thinking the same thing. This is kind of our frustration, obviously, with this, uh, a situation like this with the vacation rentals, especially if they're not, we don't even know they, they exist. So that's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a real challenge. But I will, <coughs> We'll, you know, we'll continue to, to, to monitor. I mean, they're part of the arrival numbers. 
Uh, I don't know, you know, again, because the individual owners and these platforms, their, their communications ability to, be, to those folks. The other piece that was very interesting in the process, as you can imagine, is, is timeshares. Because, you know, you got timeshares that actually have deeded property here. Um, but, and, and, you know, the question would be, would you rather, would you rather uh, be in one of these hot spots or would you rather be sitting in your timeshare in Hawaii? We get that, but we still needed them to move. And that's why the, the industry stepped up. Yes. As you know, like Disney, which is primarily a timeshare, has asked all their, their guests to, to leave for now and come back uh, when the crisis is over. And I know the other timeshare companies are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just to um, put in an input on the um, forms, now that we're asking for 14 days, certainly they're gonna put where they're staying, but prior to this, it's all voluntary, right? So as far as knowing how many people are staying in timeshares or in anything, yeah. it's all been voluntary. So that data does not, no, will not exist in any kind of definitive way, correct? Right. Correct. Okay. Before this, we were not capturing uh, the data for the location that people right. were staying. We, in the, on the back side of the floor, which is, or right. side okay, of the floor, I just floor, wanted to, majority, I just want to make that point. You ask people their accommodation choice, and they'll um, check off hotel, timeshare, vacation rental, et cetera. Um, but we weren't um, capturing yes. or, or even tracking the addresses on the front. Okay. Because of the amount of um, manual verification we need for labor. Okay, and thank you. Is different, <laughs> and they're going to be verified in every single form. Um, we will have good capture of that information for DOT airports. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that the public aren't confused when we, we mentioned earlier to a question about that, that in fact it is voluntary, so uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, for our senators online. Statement is from and Senator Favela. And, and Senator, obviously that's our frustration with the illegal vacation rentals, but that doesn't help us right now. And so, you know, they're gonna, we, we put it out through all of our distribution. We put it out, um, uh, you know, to every, everywhere that we communicate with the, with the visitor industry. I think your, your point is well taken. I maybe, let me, um, let me, let me, uh, I'm going to reach out to, to the Airbnb and DRBOs and all those guys and see if we, they can help us through it. Yeah, thank you, Lamar. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And they're going to get us, they'll get a, unfortunately, we hate to have people have a rude awakening when they, they come in tomorrow and are told they're going to be there for 14 days, but they go back to your comment again. We don't, you know, we don't. We, we, we have no way to verify in the, on the legal, illegal destination. So, you know, but they'll be required, and it'll actually, you know, the, they'll be required to put in their address. So, you know, this may be an opportunity. The numbers should be pretty pretty low by tomorrow on total rivals. So, Chris. Based on what our, our, our staff is showing. So, so Chris, are they um, going to, are these. They may be out, so. Chris, are these visitors, when they come here and find out they're gonna be 14 day quarantine, will be allowed to turn around and go back? Yes. Okay. In, in fact, thank you for bringing that up. That is something that we've, we've talked to the airlines and we've talked to the hotel, to the, to the airport. We wanna make sure we can we can help expedite that if we need to. I don't, like I said, I don't think the numbers are gonna be huge, but we wanna help them turn around if they want to. Yeah, because some might be coming in not knowing that they only they have to stay here for 14 days. They might have only seven days of uh, of a vacation, yeah. and um, so we. Yeah, I think you. I think I think you're right. I think you know. Unfortunately, not everyone. You know, and the, and I don't want to generalize millennials, but a lot of them 
just don't pay attention. Right. And they probably saw, they probably just decided cheap, that he was going to get away. But, and they saw a cheap flight or something. But again, the numbers look pretty low as we look at for tomorrow. So we'll, we're, we're just going to have to be, you know, I don't think anyone would want to stay in the place for 14 days in a row. And, and, and as you guys know, there's no restaurants open. You can't go to the beach. All those things. So, well, plus so they'll be quarantined. We're going to do everything we can to encourage them to turn around. Right. Because they'll be quarantined, so they won't be able to even go to a restaurant. Somebody's going to have to right. bring in their food, room service right. or something. Yeah. Yep. Chris, in that regard, um, is there any way that you could work with the airlines or with your your retailers or whatever to, on the other end, before they come, have some way of noticing that, you know, Hawaii is, you know, uh, requiring a quarantine when you come off the plane? Well, they are. So that they don't come and then find out. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're, we're confident we put it out there, but I think that's a great idea, and I will I will make the call this afternoon to make sure they're doing that. If nothing else, at least when they're sitting in the lounge waiting to board, that they can make that announcement and see how many want to come and cancel and. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a great idea. I, again, we assume, that, and we shouldn't assume that we we've given all the information there. Well, and the airlines don't really want them coming. In fact, they're, as you know, most of them are shutting down completely for a while, uh, for the, for the, at least for the foreseeable future. But um, I, I think that's a great idea, and I'll, I'll reach out to all the airlines this afternoon, the big ones, and we'll get, we'll get them all. We got enough, our team is here, we've got our DOC open, so we'll, we'll that will, that's what we'll do all afternoon today, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senators online, any more questions? I just got a quick question. Donovan De La Cruz. Is there any talk about repurposing some of the hotel hotels temporarily for um, visitors such as FEMA or incoming nurses so that they could be housed? Thank, thank you, Dr. Yes, absolutely. We've given the list and all the contacts of uh, uh, FEMA. And all, uh, we know the big companies that I've been talking to have all offered their, their facilities for exactly that. So, Haima uh, uh, has their names and contacts, and uh, they all know that they're going to get contacted if, if the need to be arising. Okay, thank you. Thank you um, for joining us, Chris Tatum, President and CEO of Hawaii Tourism Authority. Really appreciate your time today, and thank you everyone online for joining us also. Thank we you. are adjourned. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.